Great. We'll, um, we will we'll kick off, because I think we're ready to... We've tested the patience of the live stream people long enough. Um, Thank you all for, for joining us for this, the, the last session of this year's West Cork History Festival. Um, as you will know, uh, what we're doing in this session is asking four historians to take different perspectives uh, on the Bandon Valley killings. Uh, we, we've reached that point in our following of the, the decade of centenaries. Uh, we're thinking about 1922. And the, the Bandon Valley killings have, in, they've clearly been the subject of acute contention and discussion uh, in recent decades uh, amongst academics. But in some of the, uh, the uh, commemoration, decade of centenaries, centenaries commemoration, they were, they were missing. The RIA collection, for example, it was striking the, the absence of this. So we thought it was uh, an opportunity that we had as the West Cork History Festival to reflect on that. Uh, and as I say, we've invited four uh, historians to talk on the subject from different vantage points. Um, what we'll do today, as distinct from yesterday, is we'll ask each of them to speak. We won't invite questions to the individuals, but we will have a panel at the end of the afternoon with all four of our speakers, where in that context, hopefully it will be possible to, to pursue the conversation. Uh, we will have, uh, we'll first hear from Gemma Clark, then we'll hear from Don Wood, and then we will have a break. And then we will come back and hear from Andy Bielenberg and then Brian Walker, and I'll introduce them in turn. Then we will have another break. So this is to reassure all of you about your uh, oxygenation in the course of the <laughs> after afternoon. Uh, and then we will have the panel. Uh, so that, that's the, uh, the structure that we'll follow. Uh, and I will therefore introduce uh, Dr. Gemma Clark um, from the University of Exeter. Uh, Gemma is a senior lecturer in British and Irish history. And she will talk to us uh, on the theme of sectarianism as a conceptual framework for thinking about uh, the Bandon Valley killings. Is it, is it the right one or not? So over to you. Thank you. So thanks very much, Simon, for the introduction. Thank you, and to Victoria, for inviting me. And for everyone working behind the scenes, a lot of people, to make this such a, a great event in person and online. And it's you know, a privilege professionally to be asked to contribute to something like this, but also personally... It's wonderful to be in West Cork, so thank you. It became something of a truism that Ireland's revolution, 1912 to 1923, was a predominantly political rather than social change, ushering in stricter control of everyday life, especially for women, um, governed by conservative institutions, notably the Catholic Church. Uh, but new research um, by myself and others, including my colleagues here today and, and speaking indeed yesterday, um, on topics including identity, violence, gender, shows that accompanying the radical uh, re redrawing of constitutional relationships within and between the UK and Ireland. Uh, this decade was also transformative for certain social groups. And in my first book, um, Everyday Violence in the Irish Civil War, published with Cambridge in 2014, I argue further that it's not actually that helpful to draw a strict line between political and social. And what I found in the areas that I've looked at is that micro cleavages over land and uh, poly religion were strongly informed by the macro split over the, the Anglo-Irish independent settlement. Emerging from these local, national, even internationally informed conflicts were two new states, North and South, home to two increasingly embattled religious and political minorities, Catholics, usually Irish nationalists in UK-controlled Northern Ireland, and Protestants, typically loyal to Britain in the Irish Free State. Now, my works focus mainly on the latter, on intimidation and harm inflicted, not exclusively but disproportionately, against Protestants, Unionists, landlords and other former representatives of the British administration living in the 26 counties established, as I'm sure you already know, by the treaty as a self-governing dominion within the Commonwealth. And since I published my book, uh, the questions of demographic change, Protestant depopulation, and more broadly the role of violence uh, in the founding of, of independent Ireland have been debated further and very passionately in the academic and public spheres. And today, as we mark the centenary of, um, or, or talk about the centenary of the Bandon Valley killings, uh, this panel is going to 
address some very important questions on what exactly happened, yes, you know, what ex happened in these neighbourhoods in April 1922 and why. That is, did the IRA shoot 13 Protestant civilians because of their religion? And we've discussed this a bit as a panel beforehand and we're, we're, we're going to aim, you know, not to repeat ourselves too much. So just to reassure you, um, my colleagues here will be going into some of the, the details in, in a bit more, uh, a bit more um, thoroughly than I will. Um, in terms of what actually happened over those, over those few nights. But what we're also doing today, crucially, is, is placing these events in wider contemporary and interpretive uh, frameworks. And my specific approach is going to be, number one, uh, to define my key term, <coughs> sectarianism, um, and number two, to think about how violence against religious minorities was seen at the time in its local, national and international context, which also speaks to the more uh, theoretical utility of that term sectarianism or religious violence as a descriptor of the past. And this will hopefully lead to some conclusions in my final section, section three, on why the question of religiously motivated violence in the Irish Revolution is so difficult, divisive, but also so very, very important. So if you'll allow me to go back to basics for a moment, so my students always roll their eyes when I start my lectures with a definition, because this is, this is apparently this is something I always do. But it can be helpful to set out a roadmap for discussion. Now, the Oxford Dictionary of Law Enforcement, and you'll, you'll realise soon why I'm, I'm quoting a legal text, um, defines sectarianism as a narrow-minded adherence to a particular sect, political, ethnic or religious, often leading to conflict with those of different sects or possessing different beliefs, Sectarian conflicts are often breeding grounds for acts of terrorism and the formation of terrorist groups. So while sect here can be political, ethnic or religious, excessive attachment to a particular party is usually, as we know, associated with religion, as seen in the Irish case, in the Catholic-Protestant denominational divide. So this definition I liked because it encapsulates um, the visceral atavism if you like, of sectarianism. And I'm sure we'll all agree with it in the sense that it's narrow-minded to hate, even hurt, those who belong to another group, hold beliefs different from our own. It conjures images of early modern wars of religion, uh, for example, where we saw the uh, Protestant Huguenots and the Roman Catholics uh, using actions derived from the Bible, so water and fire, uh, to defend their truths, to... Uh, purify their heretical enemies uh, by using these, these biblical tools, you know, fire and water to drown and, and to burn. Now, Natalie Zeman Davis, who famously studied these religious rites in 16th century France and other cultural historians, read um, meaning into actions, historical acts and actors' behaviour. Um, so their argument, which I, which I follow in, in my sort of wider work that I'm doing on arson, and histories of fire as protest in Ireland. We look at words, symbols, and objects, and then we use that to understand why people do things. Because, as David Fitzpatrick says, you know, motivations are notoriously resistant to historical analysis. Now, the second part of the quotation, sectarianism as a breeding ground for terrorism, is also a helpful talking point to begin my paper today. Because in the act of defining the term, it seems like the author might have fallen foul of some of its inherent assumptions. That is that religion, because it's supposedly and especially, um, in the words of William T. Kavanagh, who, who actually calls religious violence a myth um, to justify you know, Western military actions, because religion is especially, quote, prone to absolutism, divisiveness and irrationality, there's this idea that it tends to promote extreme violence, notably terrorism. Now, as we know, so-called terrorists pursue political goals that are no less rooted, well, in my mind anyway, in ideology or logic um, than those of state forces or official armies. Um, but still, as we know, living in a post-9-11 world, there's all too often a false equivalence drawn between these kind of extreme forms of violence, like terrorism, especially Islamic terror and um, primitivism. So this is what kind of conjures this around these, this word sectarianism, which I want to <coughs> break, break apart a bit today. And of course, that's not to say that prejudice based on religious or ethnic difference isn't a factor in historical conflict or indeed doesn't drive acts of violence today. Um, under UK law, if an offender has um, demonstrated hostility or been motivated by hostility based on race, 
religion, disability, sexual orientation or transgender identity, they can be prosecuted under specific legislation, the Crime and Disorder Act of 1998, which created these uh, racially aggravated offences, and the Sentencing Act of 2020, which allows prosecutors to apply for an uplift in sentence for those convicted of a, of a hate crime. So these recent laws codify what judges have been doing for years, that's taking into account uh, mitigating and aggregate, aggravating factors. And in, in Ireland, uh, the process isn't formalised in, in quite the same way, and I'm by no means a legal expert, but such offences are, are dealt with via the Prohibition of Incitement to Hatred Act of 1989. Now, if the law recognises hatred and revenge as drivers for violence, I think it's productive if historians do too, uh, even though it's difficult. And I've already alluded to some of the emotions around this topic today, and, and, and Simon mentioned that too in, in his introduction. And I imagine it's hard if you're from the area and have a, f a familial connection, especially to see uh, academics poking around in um, personal, family, communal trauma. So that's why I'm not, it's not my desire to rehearse the uh, nationalist versus revisionist bitterness of the last 25 years or so, but rather to use sectarianism carefully as an interpretive framework and to reflect in the next part of the paper on how violence against religious minorities was understood at the time. So, excuse me, sorry. Contemporary news reports, pamphlets, um, fundraising materials for so-called suffering loyalists and so on, all the kind of sources I've looked at and indeed my colleagues are very familiar with, they capture the threatening atmosphere pervading many local communities during this, this revolutionary period. From 1919, the decline and eventual demobilisation of British police and armed forces and a subsequent vacuum in the staffing and experience of their replacement and Garda Shikona left increasingly vulnerable to social and political violence those associated with the old regime, with the British. A letter to the Morning Post from an anonymous loyalist in February 1920 describes the, quote, oppressed state of many parts of the south and west of Ireland. And they said, the police have been removed from many of the outlying stations and are confined to their barracks at night, lest they should be murdered. At night, the country lives in the undisputed possession of the rebels and of the criminal classes. Nervous people live in a state of terror. They are terrified if a knock comes to the door. Houses are raided nightly by bandits looking for arms and ammunition. Rarely are any arrests made, as it is, as it is as much as anyone's life is worth to give evidence. The police are engaged in their barracks in fighting pitched battles with well-drilled and well-armed bands of rebels. Now, these attacks on infrastructure were, in fact, successful in physically and symbolically removing British rule from Ireland. Uh, 700 of the 1,300 barracks operational in January 1919 had closed by January 1921. The political wing of the Republican movement, Sinn Féin MPs who'd withdrawn from Westminster to form a revolutionary parliament, administered an alternative Irish state via Dáil and ministries and courts. The Morning Post correspondent similarly emphasises the political or state-building uh, motivations behind this violence against civilians. They say, the oppression is on the part of these pro-German rebels against the king's government and the oppressed are the king's loyal and law-abiding subjects. Now, as everyday violence against loyalists intensified during the Civil War, a further de decolonisation being necessary, in the eyes of the anti-treaty IRA at least, because of the inadequate terms of the treaty with Britain, um, my study, my micro-study of, of some parts of Munster, so Limerick, Tipperary, Waterford, that I cover in my first book, found that it wasn't only Protestants, but also Catholic ex-servicemen and Royal Irish Constabulary, RIC personnel, as well as strong farmers and graziers who had recently, or as it was perceived unfairly, acquired their land, who were punished with acts including arson, boycott, threatening notices, punished as enemies of the Republic. Now, the killings that we're talking about today in West Cork in April 1922 occurred as the IRA and the country at large took sides over this independent settlement, the treaty, although, of course, before the military phase began, almost exactly 100 years ago, um, with the shelling of Republican-held forecourts in Dublin by the Free State Army. Uh, as an episode of revolutionary violence, then, uh, what happened here uh, was both strangely familiar and extraordinarily brutal. In response to the shooting dead of IRA commander Michael O'Neill, in a raid on Ballygroman House, the killing of his shooter, Herbert Woods, and family members Thomas Hornibrook and his son Samuel 
could you know, generously be said to, to, to take the form of an execution in the sense of a tit-for-tat you know, warfare typical of the period. And as I say, you know, we're going to be looking into the events in much more detail as the panel goes on. But two further nights of murder took an unprecedented toll on local Protestants. Never during the revolution had so many civilians belonging to the minority religion been killed in a single incident like this. And they were from varied ages and social backgrounds. Uh, the most obvious connection between the, 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 the ten dead, so the, following the, the, the three at Valley Groman, retired draper, solicitor, chemist, postal worker, five farmers, unemployed youth, that this, the common link there was, was indeed their denomination. So the Belfast newsletter's characterisation of the Bandon Valley killings as a massacre to, quote, exterminate Protestantism wasn't therefore controversial at the time. It was all, it also, this piece reported uh, the Protestant Archbishop of Dublin's response, which chimes with our earlier definition of sectarianism as narrow-minded or lacking sense, perhaps. Uh, he said, the reason for this organised massacre I cannot conceive unless it be, as has been suggested, by way of reprisal. But I fail to see what is the connection between these residents in the west of County Cork and the troubles in the north. No, I cannot see any intelligible cause for this declaration of war upon a defenceless community. And I know Brian's going to talk about the Northern and All Island perspective much more. Um, and of course, this anti-nationalist newspaper that I've just quoted from served a particular agenda and audience, as did all commercial presses in this new age of mass democracy and, and relative freedom for journalists following the, the restrictions in the First World War. But nevertheless, these words and actions, crucially, of religious and ethnic bigotry were all too familiar in this period. Um, this period being of, of one of post-war unmixing of peoples in Europe, as um, Peter Hart kind of, in some ways, euphemistically put it, and on, you know, as we know, his work is, um, is important but controversial in this field, as seen in his, in his 98 and 2003 books on the IRA in County Cork. Um, and you may know about um, a documentary that's been made by TG4 coming up called Murder in West Cork that's going to present the case for and against Hart in... In, in much more detail, so I'm sure we'll, we may well also return to this in Q&A, but just, just to flag that. So it's not to say that, um, you know, I'm using these terms, unmixing of people, uh, these European trends. It's not, I'm not against the careful application of legal conceptual terms to past events, because I wouldn't be a very good, you know, scholar if I, if I was. And I've been doing some work recently on, on counterinsurgency, which wasn't a term implied at the time, but I think it really has relevance in, in what the British were doing in Ireland. But... Ethnic cleansing, um, as seen around a century ago, this kind of period in Armenia, Greece, Turkey, does not describe accurately the mistreatment of minorities in Ireland, at least not in the southern counties that became the free state. Um, nonetheless, what's important is that terms such as massacre, extermination, crusade, pogrom, recur in the sources, resonating strongly with people at the time who saw violence against them as part of a wider persecution on the grounds of religion. Now, of course, as I'm sure you know, a pogrom is an organised massacre of a particular ethnic group, usually associated with the Jews in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, but it was also used at this time to describe the state and semi-state persecution of Catholics in the newly partitioned Northern Ireland. And the statistics, um, in terms of the victims, and in terms of the types of violence used, uh, suggest that this could be a helpful way to look at events, you know, a cultural history reading of the tactics, burning whole Catholic streets, tearing off crucifixes, um, points to religiously motivated uh, violence on the part of both civilian mobs and security forces. But it, and significantly, it wasn't only Sinn Féin propaganda, um, such as the Irish Bulletin, that described or decried pogroms um, the albeit broadly nationalist Irish News also reported on sympathy and funds arriving for expelled Catholics from all quarters of the globe. And groups of Southern Protestants, uh, such as the anti, uh, Irish Anti-Reprisals and Conciliation Committee, came together to organise opinion against uh, sectarian strife in the North. And um, I think Brian's going to touch on kind of how it was commemorated today and, and maybe some parallels there in terms of um, how both communities have responded to... to to, the, to sort of the killing of the other, as it were. But I, the reason I'm underlining, um, looking at this coverage, is, is just to underline the importance of looking at how people at the time, including, and perhaps especially those like 
the Southern Protestant Anti-Reprisal Committee, who didn't have a direct political stake in what was going on in, in Northern Ireland, how they uh, understood victimisation of minorities. In his important research on the Irish uh, Grants Committee, the British compensation body that re, uh, remunerated self-declared loyalists for injuries suffered during the revolution, um, Brian Hughes seeks not to get to the bottom of what actually happened to Southern Protestants, but how the dwindling minority viewed themselves. And I think this is really helpful. Campaign literature from lobbying groups such as the Irish Claims Compensation Association, Southern Irish Loyalist Relief Association, deploys pretty much interchangeably loyalist and Protestant, while also acknowledging the suffering of Catholics, who, in the words of one pamphlet, have always capitalised, stood by the empire. And now this may um, sort of simply indicate familiarity with the language needed to secure compensation. Um, applicants to the IGC had to prove their loss or injury was occasioned in respect or on account of allegiance to the government of the UK prior to the truce of July 1921. And Hughes, Brian Hughes, who, who focuses on County Cavern, quotes Church of Ireland clergyman Reverend McDougall. He says, every Protestant house in Arva and Cavan was visited not because they were Protestant, but because every Protestant had and has liking for the Union Jack. Now, I've, I've talked about compensation language. I don't think McDougall and others are being, simply being cynical here, because these testimonies speak to how religion functions in the modern world as an identity label, a signifier not only of uh, spiritual belief, but also, and perhaps more importantly, of who you are in a broader sense, your ethnicity, class, heritage, um, or to quote the Channel 4 sitcom Derry Girls, whether you like to march and hate ABBA, or watch RT and have freckles, and, and I'm sure you know which, one, which way around that goes. Um, and for a less frivolous example, you know, recent wars in the Middle East have shown, of course, that the Sunni Shia division is now about, about power rather than um, the original schism over who should, who, should, uh, who should succeed the prophet. So, you know, in countries which have been governed by the majority sect, the um, Sunnis, the Shia, tend to make up the poorest sections of society. So it's just an urban person coming to the countryside with all the hay fever and stuff. It's very, I apologise. Um, so that your uh, religion might determine your wealth, your profession, your schooling, is, that's not, of course, it's not a recent um, concern. You know, when I'm talking about how, when I talk about how religion functions in the modern times, I'm aware that this is not, this is not something that's new. But it is the case that these distinctions between us have become more important in the last 200 years or so. Um, as Christopher Bailey uh, theorised, globali uh, globalisation, and um, so he was like the pioneer of the global history approach. Globalisation brings uniformities on the one hand, shared philosophical and political ideas, institutional organisation, cultural norms around how to dress. Um, you know, what to buy. But on the other hand, greater interaction has also produced a deepening sense of difference. From the 19th century, nationalist movements embraced religion and or ethnicity in order to resist against imperial rule, whether that be British or French, you know, or Dutch, and establish the small nation states that proliferated after the Great War, you know, including Ireland, or at least the, the Free State. Um, Recognising this shift in the global order, the notion of difference or otherness has also become a major an analytical tool in cultural studies. So perhaps, to put it bluntly, um, we're seeing sectarianism because we're looking for it. I mean, I'm not saying I agree with that, but th this, is, this, is how, this, is, this is what it could lead us to thinking. And if we look at some of the writing on the more recent Northern Ireland Troubles, we have Simon Prince say we should look beyond ethnicity. Rachel Kowalski argues that the provisional IRA shot the uniform, regardless of who was wearing it. Now, I'm sympathetic, as I said, right at the start to examining political and military events alongside and as intrinsically enmeshed with social and cultural issues. You know, we need the constitutional context, partition and independence to understand the mistreatment of minorities. It's consequently often hard to unscramble who someone is from uh, what they've done when we're thinking about why they might have been attacked. Um, you know, while exceptional in their scale, the April 1922 killings uh, in the Bandon Valley area were, as many of you know, sadly part of a longer history of targeting of Protestants. In a fundraising pamphlet I read called um, Appalling List of Victims During the First Four Months of 1921, we hear, for example, of Sweetnam and Connell, two Protestant farmers, quote, in a large way near the town of Skibbereen. Their offence was that they'd given evidence against the man who'd been levying subscriptions for the IRA 
a practice which was very widespread and, in the words of the pamphlet, disobedience to which is fraught with extreme peril. Now, this is a very familiar narrative. Um, in Limerick, Tipperary and Waterford in the Civil War, I find that former business and social links with British forces, defiance of IRA authority or demands for money, even innocuous displays of loyalty <coughs> post-treaty, like singing a song in favour of the treaty, could be punished with violence. Now, in this pamphlet, Sweetenham and Connell are also described as significant property owners. And I have many more examples of resentment of religious and political minor uh, resentment of these minorities intersecting with, with land hunger calls for redistribution. But in the, in the Bandon Valley case, by contrast, it's much harder to identify these other motivations. April 1922 was technically a period of truce, though the atmosphere of distrust and accusations of disloyalty evidently hadn't dissipated. A total of 18 men, um, so 13 civilians, but it's 18 men, died by political violence over these few days, including um, three British intelligence officers and their driver, Hendy, Dove, Henderson, Private Jail Brooks. And they'd aroused suspicion outside uh, McCroom just hours after the Ballygroman killings on 26th of April, seized and executed by the RA. The deaths of these soldiers might also relate, might relate to the aims of the Dunmanway killers to stop the flow of valuable information between supposed British sympathisers, the control of information being so fundamental to guerrilla warfare. Although it is worth saying, and I know my colleagues are going to explore this in much more detail, that even if the 13 victims had passed on information to the authorities, they were not members of this shadowy anti-Sinn Féin league because the league's propaganda, it's been, it's been proven or largely agreed what was produced by the British police force in Ireland as a cover for reprisals and unofficial attacks on civilians um, and IRA supporters. Okay, so just to bring it towards a close. <coughs> Hatred, retaliation, revenge. These were engines for violence during the revolution. And I discuss these themes in a forthcoming uh, History Island podcast to mark the centenary of the death of Connor Kilty's own, Michael Collins, um, which I'm focusing specifically on the killing squad and, and incursions into the new Northern Irish state. Now, I don't think it should be controversial to point out partiality and bigotry on the part of the early IRA, nor indeed of loyalist paramilitaries in Northern Ireland, just as I've also written um, for a forthcoming Oxford handbook on colonial insurgency and counterinsurgency on the brutality of British state forces and unjustifiable violence by them against civilians in Ireland. So why still this impulse to either avoid talking about West Cork altogether? You know, Simon mentioned it didn't feature in that in the really um, important and impressive uh, RIA volume, 1922. Or, or, or why, if we do talk about this sort of impulse to ascribe a monocausal mo motivation, is it social or political? Is it sectarian or military? As Brian Hanley said of another atrocity that, quote, struck a raw nerve, the June 1921 killing of the Protestant brothers at Coola Crease in County Offaly, the War of Independence, quote, ha um, Hanley, involved a great deal of killing, much of it equally as brutal and sordid as the case of the Pearson brothers. And, the, and I found the Civil War arguably even more so. Um, so what, why this, why this con controversy around these awful but, but rare spectacles and what can we maybe take from that for the future. And I think the word spectacle is key here because these events capture imagination and attention more so than the more mundane um, thousands of little acts of aggression and hostility um, that I called everyday violence in my, in my first book. And so they, because of the, they're, they're, they're big and they're horrific, they become um, a convenient microcosm of the conflict, a canvas for playing out wider agendas and ideologies. Bandon Valley, Kula Crees and so on, call into question the basic character of the independence struggle, moral campaign, of Irish militants against British oppressors or bitter sectarian conflict over religion, politics and land. And the problem is, and maybe I shouldn't say it because I will stop getting invited to write opinion pieces and record podcasts, is that history actually favours nuance over binary yes or no answers to these big questions. Um, and it's not really my job to moralise. But also, you know... Despite the brilliant job the Irish um, government departments, academics and archivists are doing to make more accessible pu uh, to the public primary sources, uh, and another challenge is, is we're also facing methodological issues around accessing motivations, experiences um, from 100 years ago. 
um, something that Andy knows very well, uh, the, the long gap between the two censuses, uh, 1911 and 26, is, is one key issue here. And holes in the data can be filled with speculation and sometimes personal grudges, which is really unfortunate, especially when you're, like we all have been, sometimes on the receiving end of some of these comments. But just because we can't answer every question doesn't mean we shouldn't try. So, which is why events like this, um, West Cork History Festival, are so important, not only in informing us about the past, but also, as we saw in Antishuk's attendance yesterday, potentially bringing some healing. Thank you for listening.